Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome welcoming you to the uh, conference. Uh, my laboratory is very interested in, in understanding pediatric brain disease. And I thought I would share with you two unpublished studies that we have ongoing in the laboratory that touch upon the importance of both germline and somatic mutations uh, and their contribution to this class of disease. Um, the brain is an, a magnificent, uh, you know, uh, organ, but it um, requires collaboration between many thousands of genes, and so as a result, there's many, many individual rare causes, and uh, we're very interested in understanding the genetic underpinnings of these diseases, developing treatments for these conditions, um, and ideally preventing them. Prevention is something that I, I think I'd like to uh, push, at least in our laboratory, it's very challenging to think of ways of preventing disease because by the time the child is born already, these diseases are set. The scope of pediatric brain disease is really enormous. Two to five percent of children manifest clinically relevant neurodevelopmental disease. One in 68 children has autism spectrum disorder. This accounts for about 10 percent of all health care costs. Um, the workups are mostly, uh, well, they're very expensive and mostly negative. These include things like MRI scans and metabolic testing. Um, of course, genetic testing has had a huge impact on our understanding of the granularity of these diseases. And with rare exceptions, targeted treatments are non-existent. And these significantly impair quality and length of life. So we've been thinking about ways of disease prevention. There's two main contributions genetically to, this, to these diseases. The first is recessive disease with uh, parental consanguinity. And in this situation, father and mother are both healthy, but they each carry a diseased allele here indicated by the C. And then uh, by subtracting away, excuse me, uh, all the heterozygous alleles in the offspring were left just with the homozygous C allele. The other example is in de novo genetic mutations where the parents have normal sequence here indicated by A, and by subtracting away their uh, normal alleles were left just with a new mutation C in the child. So we've been thinking about ways of preventing disease with this information, knowing that these two um, mechanisms make a major contribution to pediatric brain disease. So in our laboratory, um, we study children with these kinds of diseases. I'm a child neurologist by training. And it, early in my training, I um, uh, realized that we, we knew very little about the causes of these diseases. So we set about putting a cohort together uh, of children with, with uh, these kinds of conditions. So our court consists of around 8,000 families with recessive or de novo undiagnosed disease. Importantly, we look for new clinical phenotypes when we recruit families. We've done sequencing on around 6,000 with exome and about 1,000 with genomes, mostly on those that are exome negative. And we've identified about 2,500 mutations, about half of them in novel genes. And these are some of the children that we've seen in our um, clinical uh, recruitment. So we thought we would test whether applying what we've learned from next generation sequencing towards uh, possibly uh, uh, um, fetal genotyping to give information to families where they have a subsequent pregnancy after a first affected uh, child with a recessive disease could impact the disease recurrence. And the rationale for this is that currently carrier testing is limited to conditions where the minor allele frequency is more than 1 in 100 in the population, such, that, such as cystic fibrosis. The pediatric brain diseases typically do not appear on fetal imaging, on MRI or on ultrasound, uh, because the brain develops uh, gyri and sulci mostly after 20 to 30 weeks gestation. And there's a wealth of new diseases, uh, disease genes for pediatric brain disease. Many, many new children are coming in where uh, we have now the molecular cause, and then families come back with a subsequent pregnancy. A fetal genotyping and subsequent pregnancies could determine the affectation status in these families. And as of now, there's no large-scale studies or clear practice guidelines, and um, no evidence that this approach would reduce population-level recurrences. And so in collaboration with a single referral center in Egypt, we set out with a, a cohort of uh, 1,172 families with previously undiagnosed pediatric brain disease. And from those families, uh, we identified 526 
that had um, a variant in a, uh, previous, uh, a gene previously linked to the disease that was concordant with the patient's phenotype. There were uh, 413 that were excluded because um, we could not find the cause from exome sequencing. And um, after this interpretation, we were left with 233 families where there was a new gene that was known. So these variants were, were classified as variants of unknown significance. And uh, clinically, these patients showed a range of pediatric brain disease, including microcephaly, degenerative brain disease, polymicrogyria, et cetera. And so these families then were, uh, uh, these variants were clinically validated in the laboratory, and then the families were invited for prenatal diagnosis with the next pregnancy uh, with a genetic counselor. And these are some of the families as an example of the ones that I've shown you. But these children are very severe. Um, and mutations that lead to defects in a cortical gyral formation, in a structure or maintenance of brain parenchyma, mutations in genes like relin, uh, TSEN2, pig uh, N gene. And you can see the family trees are typical for recessive with, with documented parental consanguinity and multiple affected members. And uh, over the course of about five years, from 2012 to 2017, there were 100 family, 101 families that returned to clinic with a subsequent pregnancy after a first affected member where we had the genetic diagnosis. And they were less than 16 weeks gestation. And uh, they underwent genetic counseling and explanation of risk to benefit ratio. There were 14 of those families that declined prenatal diagnosis with amniocentesis because they felt that it wouldn't impact their decision of whether to continue the pregnancy. So 87 of them were then subjected to uh, application of medical decision support software. To be sure, we really we felt we had the right variant because in the course of uh, re-evaluation, you know, there's a lot of new medical literature and we wanted to be sure that the variants were still classified as pathogenic. So there were three of them that fell out because with, upon re-evaluation, we felt uncertain about the pathogenicity of that variant. And that left 84 families and those all underwent amniocentesis after uh, genetic counseling. And then the decision support software that we use is, is called SimiConsult. We opted for this, it's a, it's a commercial software. Um, because it allowed for an unbiased comparison between phenotype and genotype in a way that didn't depend upon a prior diagnosis. Um, one inputs the uh, signs and symptoms into the, into the uh, website, as well as family history. And then um, this results in a differential diagnosis that ranks the probability of various conditions. And then the entire BCF is uploaded as well. And it does a joint, it calculates a joint probability. And in this example here uh, from this family, number 819, we see that one gene stands out where the clinical phenotype matches a, a gene that shows a very high severity score with the mutation. The gene is TSEN54. And that leads to a very high pertinence for the gene mutation. And we did that for all the families that underwent amniocentesis, and we found very high uh, pertinence of those mutations. These are the genes that were identified in those families and the mutations. And so from those 84 families that underwent amniocentesis, there were 24 that genotyped positive for, a, for the biallelic variant in the subsequent pregnancy in the fetus, and 60 of them genotyped uh, negative for the biallelic variant. From those 24, um, eight of those families decided to carry the pregnancy to term, even with this knowledge. And the rationale given for that was that this, either uh, due to some difficulty in the family, such as a financial, religious, or logistical reasons, they decided to uh, continue with the pregnancy. And then upon clinical evaluation after birth of those children, uh, each one of them showed evidence of disease that was concordant with the older affected child. There were 16 that decided to terminate the pregnancy, and the, of the 60 that had uh, uh, absence of the biallelic uh, variant on fetal genotyping, there was one spontaneous miscarriage, and 59 of the others uh, continued to term, and there were 59 children that uh, none of them showed evidence of the disease upon birth, but one of them showed evidence of a different disease, which is not too surprising in this cohort with, uh, with very high consanguinity. So does this reduce the recurrence of the disease? Uh, the decisions that these families made did reduce the recurrence. Of course, from recessive disease, we expect 25% recurrence and 75% unaffected. And theoretically, from a cohort of 67 families, as I've showed you, where there were live-born children, 
We'd expect 16.75 affected and 50.25 unaffected children. And what we observed was 12% um, affected and 88% unaffected uh, from live-born children. Excuse me. These were the observed numbers here, eight affected, 59 unaffected. And the uh, binomial p-value, the two-tailed test, re revealed a uh, 0.01 p-value with 95% confidence interval of 0 0.4, 0.04 to 0.2. So in conclusion, this was the, uh, I think, the first large-scale comprehensive report of combining exome and, and genome sequencing with prenatal testing and, uh, and counseling that impact recurrence rate in recessive disease in a population scale. We detected disease-causing variants with high certainty and predicted the affectation status for a fetus of these fully penetrant Mendelian disorders with 100% negative predictive value. We weren't able to calculate a positive predictive value, of course, because we were not able to, to uh, phenotype the uh, abortuses. And the disease burden was de decreased from 25 to 12%. And so we suggest this as a potential workflow. Of course, um, physicians and, and families will make their own decisions about how to proceed with this. But we like this idea of, of reevaluating the families on a, on a yearly basis uh, to make sure we really have confidence in the genetic mutation. And then as new genes and new diseases are clarified, such approaches will only grow in power. For instance, the families that we excluded from analysis because we didn't have the mutation identified or because they were novel genes, of course, over time, as those genes become published, they'll also be able to benefit from such an approach. The future questions about this is, are, are annual re-evaluations of exome or genomes um, warranted? We think that they are. Um, should one be perform fetal performing fetal genotyping or fetal MRI scan for assessments? I've already mentioned the limitations of imaging of the fetus for brain disease. Uh, what's the best, best method to access uh, fetal DNA? Chorionic villus vil sampling. Uh, we chose amniocentesis because it was relatively straightforward. And of course, non-invasive prenatal testing is getting a lot of traction. Um, of course, the same kind of results could have been achieved using pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, but it really is not accessible in the referral center in Egypt that we worked with. And of course, eventually, we'd like to get to premarital genotyping for family members uh, versus, um, for instance, in, uh, for Tay-Sachs disease in the Ashkenazi population, looking at uh, carrier status has been able to reduce the incidence of disease. It's much more challenging in, in very outbred populations or where there's many, many mutations that are um, in the population. And um, we're very interested to know if um, this uh, kind of approach is, uh, shows power with other studies. So the other class of disease where I think we can begin to consider uh, prevention is in de novo genetic mutations. But of course the challenge there is that both parents have a normal genotype and it's only the child that has the new mutation. We think of de novo genetic mutations as arising at the time of uh, fertilization. We think of that the father and mother each contribute a healthy germ cell, and then a mutation here occurs at the time of fertilization in the zygote, and then the zygote gives rise to the, to the, uh, the fetus. But the single biggest risk factor for the number of de novo mutations in an offspring is paternal age. And this is a paper from uh, Kang and, uh, and Decode and Kari Stephenson's group that showed um, the, the father's age at conception versus the number of de novo mutations in an offspring, and you can see a very tight correlation. Uh, roughly 20 to 25 to 50 percent of neurodevelopmental diseases are due to de novo mutations. 80 percent of de novo mutations are attributed to the father. They arise on the paternal haplotype. And the number of, of these de novo mutations doubles for every decade the father is older at the time of conception. And this is attributed to a proliferation of sperm cells, whereas eggs don't really proliferate uh, in the course of the parent. So we began to wonder, could we use this, um, what must be gonadal mosaicism in the father to predict disease, uh, to identify uh, uh, families at high, with high risk of recurrence for, from de novo genetic mutations? And we think of the sperm really as holding the key uh, to whether the child is going to have a, a, a severe disease. So that's we kind of depicted that with the schematic of a sperm with a brain underneath it, because that's going to, the health of the, the genome of the sperm is going to determine the health of the brain in the child. And these, 
Uh, de novo mutations are identified typically now by clinical genetic testing, and they're offer, often assigned a low risk of recurrence. Like many of you, if a family comes in with a de novo mutation, we usually quote around a 1% recurrence risk. But I think that's contributed, that's really constituted by two different populations. One, families that have a relatively high risk and families that have relatively low risk, and we're interested in using this to stratify the risk for those families. Previous studies had just looked at a parental mosaicism using um, restricted peripheral uh, DNA samples. So we started this study using a, a three-phase analysis of male gonadal mosaicism. We uh, performed sequencing from blood and sperm from uh, eight fathers from nuclear families, and we performed 200x whole genome sequencing on those males, and then 30x genome sequencing on the mother and the offspring of those families. And we performed th these three phases. The first was an assessment of de novo mutations in sperm. In other words, these are the mutations that are present in the child, and we looked back at the sperm to see if there was any evidence of them uh, in, in the, in the uh, father's sperm sample from semen. The second was an unbiased analysis of what we call mosaic SNVs from sperm, irrespective of whether they were evident in a child. And the third is detection of a disease causing de novo SNVs in sperm from families where we see a disease already uh, in an affected child. So in this analysis from eight families, we performed whole genome sequencing, and we found uh, 912 de novo mutations in the family, in, in the children of these, of these families. Most of these are benign. Most of them occur in non-coding regions. And then we analyzed the sperm from those same families to determine which of those mutations in the children were evident in the paternal sample. And we uh, broke those into, into, uh, into four categories. Here we found that 2.5% of those mutations were evident in the father's sperm at 200x uh, sequence coverage. And we used a threshold of at least two mutant reads in the father's sperm. And they were divided into four main classes. First, those that are present just in blood, uh, there was uh, two, of the, two of the 23 or 8.7%, excuse me. Um, those that are equally present in sperm, I'm gonna stop using the arrow here because it's causing me to skip slides. Um, those that are equally present in sperm and in blood, those that are present in, there's a sperm enriched, and those that were present in sperm only, 34.8% were only present in sperm. And uh, of those, we, we, we've then compared the allelic fraction in blood versus the allelic fraction in sperm. And what you can see from these families here, indicated with their family number, is as the allelic fraction in sperm increases, after a threshold of about 10% allelic fraction in sperm, we start to see evidence of the mutation in the parent's blood. And this is in, in the father's blood. And this is consistent with work from Flora Vaccarino's group, looking at uh, fetal uh, mosaicism once mosaicism rises above a certain level in one tissue, it's almost always evident in another tissue. So in the fathers, they can have low levels of mosaicism in sperm only, but after that allelic, allelic fraction crosses about the 10% threshold, we start to see evidence of mosaicism in the blood as well. Um, these mutations we, we found in, in the father's sperm were roughly a two to 20 per father with allelic fractions in the range of two to 17%. So using the same paradigm, we're looking at, at the allelic fractions, and these are ranked according to their allelic fraction from these eight families. So each father has between two and 20 de novo mutations evident in the sperm that are also evident in the child. And of course, we see a, a exponential decay because it's unlikely to see high allelic uh, fractions in sperm. One surprising thing we found from this analysis was that the blood showed an age-dependent rise in mosaic SNVs, whereas the sperm showed an age-dependent drop in SNVs. And this is depicted here looking at both the number of um, mosaic SNVs and the mean allelic fraction of, for those SNVs according to the father's age, here indicated along the x-axis. And in blood you can see the number of SNVs, uh, mosaic SNVs rises correlated with paternal age, as does the mean allelic fraction. And this will be consistent with perhaps some sort of clonal collapse from blood progenitor cells. And over time, the allelic, fra allelic fractions rise for certain clones that outcompete other clones in the um, uh, blood progenitor cell. In sperm, we saw the opposite effect. 
as men age, we found a reduced number of mosaic SNVs and a reduced allelic fraction for those SNVs over time. Of course, this seems kind of counterintuitive because as, as I mentioned, the older a male gets, the higher percent that there's going to be a de novo mutation in an offspring. But I think that's because many of those mutations are going to be below the level of detection that we're able to look at here with 200x whole genome sequencing. We're looking at just those variants that we can detect with two or more reads. In the third phase of this analysis, we looked at um, the offspring for the mutations that we found de novo uh, as causative in those families. We had 11 families. These are the family numbers here, and these are the genes that we found mutated. These are de novo deleterious mutations. And then we looked back using DDPCR at the uh, paternal semen sample to see if there was any evidence of the mutation. And these the semen samples were collected many years after the conception of the child, up to uh, between uh, 2 and 15 years of age. Um, these children were 2 or 15 years of age at the time we collected this, the second semen, the semen sample on the, on the father. These are the families down here and the allelic fractions. So in, in most of the families, we did not find any evidence for mosaicism for that mutation. But in three of the fathers, we found evidence for gonadal mosaicism uh, in the range of uh, very low, 0.5%. Uh, this one here was at 8% in the sperm, and this one was at 14% in the sperm. This is very interesting because it suggests that these mutations, many of them, are, are not occurring in, in single sperm cells, but they're present in sperm progenitor cells that are present throughout the entire life of the man and continue to be present and could impact the recurrence risk for these kinds of diseases. Uh, we are very interested in this one, in this, in this family 09. This family here was recruited as a singleton family with, a, we thought, a single affected member with autism, epilepsy, and mental retardation. And when we called the family to discuss the results, they said their two older children had had subtle neurological symptoms. They considered them to be not diseased. These are the two children here. One had attention deficit disorder, and one had childhood onset seizures. When we genotyped those two children, they, we found they had exactly the same disease-causing mutation as the younger child. The mutation was de novo uh, at a splice site in the GRIN2A gene. And this gene is known to cause a wide range of neurological signs and symptoms. This suggested that this father had the mutation in, this, in, in, um, in the gonad as a, as a gonadal mosaic mutation and transmitted it three times to each of the three children, each of which is left with a different type of neurological condition. We validated those results by looking at the DDPCR. Uh, the father in the blood sample showed 1% allelic fraction for that mutation. The mother showed no evidence of the mutation. An affected member showed roughly 50% as would be expected from a germline mutation. And father's sperm collected at two different time points showed roughly 15% allelic fractions. The controls showed no evidence of a mosaicism for that mutation. So um, it's got a little cut off here, but just so we, we think of these mutations um, as occurring, a percent of them occur very early during embryogenesis of the male in the primordial germ cells that eventually um, produce, give rise to the uh, sperm progenitor stem cells, these uh, primordial gem, uh, germ cells. And in, in, if, it ha if those mutations happen early enough, they can um, seed the testes and produce mutant sperm throughout the life of the man. Those mutations can occur early and are detectable, whereas mutations that occur relatively late in single cells within the sperm, like this down here, are going to be below the levels of detection and we think are contributing uh, the majority of these de novo mutations that are not going to be approachable with these kinds of diseases. So to conclude, we found evidence for sperm mosaicism in roughly 2.5% of the de novo mutations. If we limit those just to paternally phased alleles, uh, that's a 4% of, of de novo mutations are evident in, in the paternal sample. Uh, the de novo uh, SNVs were either sperm enriched or sperm only in the majority of cases. These uh, mosaic SNVs um, uh, that were more than 10% allelic fraction were almost always detectable in blood, and that suggests an embryonic origin in the, in the father. A general uh, semen sample contains between 2 and 20 detectable mosaic SNVs with allelic fractions between 2 and 17%. And sperm shows an age-dependent drop in mosaic SNVs, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, three of the 11, 27% of the deleterious mutations that we found 
that um, in these families where they were paternally phased, we, showed, we found evidence of mosaicism between 0.5 and 14%. And I think that assessing sperm then can predict recurrence from de novo SNVs. And there's a potential to reduce disease burden for these de novo mutations by identifying males at risk. I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, laboratory members, Martin Bruce and Renee Georges did the majority of the work on the sperm analysis. The fetal analysis was, was performed by uh, Zena with help from a single referral center, Dr. Mahazaki and clinical geneticist um, and uh, um, genetic counselors and maternal fetal specialists at her center in, in Cairo. And we've had help from many sequencing centers and, and funding agencies are listed here. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.